Hey friends, Jill High Earth here. Well, I've opened up a can of worms. <laughs> I've been doing these Ask Jill Anything videos in order to manage the you know volume of emails, comments, and direct messages that I get. And well, I seem to have found a way to get more. <laughs> so, so thanks everybody who's submitting some really cool questions online. I uh, will try and answer four or five every time I do one of these videos. So, uh, so here we go. Question one. Hmm. How much more challenging is cold water cave diving? Is it only a matter of proper equipment and protection? Is there a psychological component? And that's from Shannon, a uh, comment uh, uh, on my Facebook page. Anyway, I would say that cold water cave diving is frankly an order of magnitude uh, above warm water cave diving. I mean, first of all, just the thermal protection means that you end up with uh, quite a bit uh, reduced dexterity, range of motion, everything. So it's hard. It's, it's, it's difficult. It's like being, you know, bound up in a straitjacket sometimes. And then uh, with your gloves, whether you're wearing seven millimeter neoprene wet gloves, or if you're wearing dry gloves, either way, there's a severely reduced dexterity. And so clips and reaching things is, is challenging. There's also the psychological component. Um, as soon as you jump in the water, obviously it feels like you just uh, chugged a Slurpee. <laughs> and at first you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And then you're like, okay, I can handle it. I'm, I'm, I'm used to it. I'm used to it. And then about 20 minutes in, you're like, I am so cold. <laughs> I'm so cold. <laughs> Uh, and then if you have decompression where you have to remain motionless, that's where it's the worst. So really cold deco is an eternity. I mean, we try to minimize our decompression obligations on cold water dives, but it's challenging. So, so yeah, I would say cold water cave diving is an order of magnitude more difficult than my cave dives like in Florida, Mexico, or the Bahamas. So thanks for that, Shannon. Great question. Uh, okay, here's another one. Uh, Dear Jill, what advice do you have for people aspiring to work for National Geographic, Discovery, BBC, etc., uh, either paid, pro bono, for experience, and or to learn? Um, I guess my first advice is to get any position to get your foot in the door, whether that is like a volunteer um, position on an expedition, filming support role, or whatever else. Uh, that's a, a good way to start. Work really, really hard. Meet as many people as you can. Make contacts. Stay in touch with them. And, um, and always ask for the gig for the next one. But um, there's nothing to stop you from pitching your own project these days either. I mean, there really are no gatekeepers. Um, you don't need National Geographic in order to um, put out a film into the world. I mean, you know, you could start a YouTube channel. <laughs> you might end up doing this. <laughs> no, but seriously though, um, you know, you don't need anyone's permission. You can just start creating content, writing photography, um, videos and putting them out into the world. And that's how you build your brand. Um, because you do have to think of yourself like a brand and a company. And, uh, that's, that's how everything starts. I mean, uh, I'm a 30 year overnight success, <laughs> but it is from putting out a lot of creative content and building my brand and contributing to projects that I believe in and causes that are important to me. Okay, that was from John. Thanks. And here's another one from Facebook. Jill, have you ever met Christina Zanato? Um, yes, I know Christina really well. She's an absolutely extraordinary human being. Um, but I'm going to warn you, um, there's no H in Christina. She's from Italy and they don't have H's in their Christina's. <laughs> so for those that don't know Christina, she is um, perhaps best known for her work with um, sharks in the Bahamas. Um, and uh, you might 
have seen her in a chainmail suit <laughs> feeding sharks or taking hooks out of them or doing the whole tonic immobility thing. So she's she's um, very, very engaged in conservation and supporting research. But Christina is also a cave diving explorer and has done an incredible work uh, doing uh, exploration in the caves near her home in the Bahamas. And um, so she's she's kind of split between both of those worlds that she uh, that she loves so much but I encourage you to look her up if you don't know who she is and uh, she has she also has a nonprofit charity people of the water um, check that out too all right uh, next question uh, okay this was this is from a very prominent uh, prominent individual uh, in diving a former uh, well a creator of one of the training agencies and his burning question is, what is the flight velocity of an African swallow? And I have to say that with an English accent, not because he's English, but because uh, if you're younger than I am, you might not know the Monty Python reference. So I'm just going to ask anyone who doesn't know the answer to that question to just Google it. <laughs> okay. All right. Question five. And this from another extraordinarily prominent uh, member of our diving community, a world record cave diver. Uh, here we go. Dear Jill, what is the strangest thing in diving that you've ever seen? Um, I've seen a lot of really strange things from uh, colonial salps swimming around in Antarctic waters to um, some pretty unusual trash finds underwater. But I think maybe a cool story to, ha to share is that I found a shipwreck in a cave. <laughs> Now, to get into this cave, it's in Bermuda, it's under a golf course community, you actually kind of go behind the bushes and there's like a locked gate covering a hole that's really hidden in the, um, in the bushes and you, you unlock it if you have the key, key and then you open the grate and it's a really small hole but it's sort of shored up with a you know, like reinforced edge now. I'm sure originally the first explorers there did not have that little concrete and gate of course and they would have just crawled down into a hole in the ground. Once you crawl down into the hole into the ground you're on the top of a boulder slope that goes down 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 down. You cannot see far enough with your headlamp when you first crawl in there but you climb down scramble down these boulders and then you get to the largest underwater lake in Bermuda. In fact uh, one of the largest underwater lakes I've seen anywhere. And standing on the shoreline of that lake, you're looking out across this beautiful turquoise water and you're in this huge amphitheater of a cave. So we were on a project there looking for life and thought we would go on a dive and see if we could find some tunnels branching off from this lake or going further down. And we got all our dive gear down there and believe me, it was a ton of work. And as we began our swim in this under, underground lake, uh, we discovered a small wrecked wooden rowboat, basically. And it was very old. And I thought, oh my gosh, like how did this get here? There's no other, you know, entrances other than climbing back up that slope and out through that hole. And so I went to the Bermuda archives and did a little bit of research and discovered that this came from the Challenger Oceanic Explorations, this um, expedition that set out to map the world's oceans uh, in the 1800s. And in these archives, they describe how they found this hole in the ground and climbed down it and discovered water underground. And so they brought one of the small, like rowboat lifeboats from the ship, carried it inland, which would have been enough work and up a hill basically, and then stuffed it down through this hole, carried it down the boulder slope, put it in the water and went for a little paddle to see what was in this underground cave. So by the time they got their job done and paddled back ashore again, I think they were tired. And I think they realized that they didn't want to carry the boat back up the slope, out the hole, and out to the ship. So they left it there. Or maybe they left it for a further 
visit. I don't know. Anyway, it must have drifted offshore and then eventually fell apart and sunk and we found the remains there. So that's a cool little thing I would have never have expected to find in this, you know, vast underwater cave. So um, kind of cool. That's in Bermuda. So that's uh, that's five more of your questions. I'll uh, do my best to keep answering more as you send them in. So reach out to me at intotheplanet.com or drop a comment in the in the feed, and I will uh, periodically uh, answer as many as I can. So thanks for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you uh, next time on Ask Jill Anything. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and check out my other YouTube videos. Thanks. Bye-bye.